Aesthetics, also spelled aesthetics, is a branch of philosophy dealing with the nature of art, beauty, and taste, with a creation and appreciation of beauty. It is more scientifically defined as the study of sensory or sensory emotional values, sometimes called judgments of sentiment and taste. More broadly, scholars in the field define aesthetics as critical reflection on art, culture, and nature. More specific aesthetic theory, often with practical implications relating to a particular branch of the arts is divided into areas of aesthetics such as art theory, literary theory, film theory, and music theory. An example from art theory is aesthetic theory, as a set of principles underlying the work of a particular artist, or artistic movement, such as the cubist aesthetic. Etymology the word aesthetic is derived from the Greek, aesthetikos, meaning aesthetic, sensitive, sentient which in turn was derived from, aesthanomai, meaning I perceive, feel, sense. The term aesthetics was appropriated and coined with new meaning in the German form aesthetic, modern spelling aesthetic, by Alexander Baumgarten, in 1734. It is also derived from the French word aesthetique. Both German and French words come from the Greek aesthetikos sensitive, perceptive. History of aesthetics. Bronze sculpture, thought to be the Poseidon or Zeus, National Archaeological Museum of Athens. Any aesthetic doctrines that guided the production and interpretation of prehistoric art are mostly unknown. Ancient art was largely, but not entirely, based on the nine great ancient civilizations, Egypt, Mesopotamia, Persia, Greece, China, Rome, India, the Celtic peoples, and Maya. Each of these centers of early civilization developed a unique and characteristic style in its art. Ancient Greek Aesthetics Greece had the most influence on the development of aesthetics in the West. This period of Greek art saw a veneration of the human physical form, and the development of corresponding skills to show musculature, poise, beauty, and anatomically correct proportions. Furthermore, in many Western and Eastern cultures alike, traits such as body hair are rarely depicted in art that addresses physical beauty. In contrast with this Greek Western aesthetic taste is the genre of the grotesque. Greek philosophers initially felt that aesthetically appealing objects were beautiful in and of themselves. Plato believed that for us to have a perception of beauty there must be a transcendent form for beauty in which beautiful objects partake, and which causes them to be beautiful also. He felt that beautiful objects incorporated proportion, harmony, and unity among their parts. Similarly, in the metaphysics, Aristotle found that the universal elements of beauty were order, symmetry, and definiteness. An example of ancient aesthetics in Greece through poetry is Plato's quote, For the authors of those great poems which we admire, do not attain to excellence through the rules of any art, but they utter their beautiful melodies of verse, in a state of inspiration, and, as it were, possessed by a spirit not their own. Indian Aesthetics Indian art evolved with an emphasis on inducing special spiritual or philosophical states in the audience or with representing them symbolically. According to Kapilavatsyayan, classical Indian architecture, sculpture, painting, literature, kvya, music, and dancing evolved their own rules conditioned by their respective media, but they shared with one another not only the underlying spiritual beliefs of the Indian religio-philosophic mind, but also the procedures by which the relationships of the symbol and the spiritual states were worked out in detail. In the pan-Indian philosophic thought the term, Satyam Shivam Sundaram, is another name for the concept of the Supreme. Sat is the truth value, Shiv is the good value and Sundaram is the beauty value. Man through his, Surbana, or education, Manana, or experience and conceptualization and, Sadhana, or practice, through different stages of life, Ashramas, comes to form and realize the idea of these three values to develop a value system. This value system helps develop two basic ideas one, that of, Daksha, or the adept slash expert, and two, of Mahana slash Parama, or the Absolute, and thus to judge anything in this universe, in the light of these two measures, known as, Adarsha. A person who has mastered great amounts of knowledge of the grammars, 
rules, and language of an art form are adepts. Daksha, whereas those who have worked through the whole system and journeyed ahead of these to become a law unto themselves is called a Mahana. Individuals' idea of Daksha and Mahana is relative to the development of the concept of Satyam Shivam Sundaram. For example, Tagore's idea of these two concepts should be above any common man's, and many perceive Tagore as a Mahana artist in the realm of literature. This concept of Satyam Shivam Sundaram, a kind of value theory, is the cornerstone of Indian aesthetics. Of particular concern to Indian drama and literature are the term bhava or the state of mind and rasa referring generally to the emotional flavor slash essence crafted into the work by the writer and relished by a sensitive spectator or sahdaya. Poets like Kaila Desai were attentive to rasa, which blossomed into a fully developed aesthetic system. Even in contemporary India the term RASA denoting flavor or essence is used colloquially to describe the aesthetic experiences in films and Salamix describes popular Hindi cinema films which serve a so-called balanced emotional meal for the masses, savored as RASA, by these spectators. Rasa theory blossoms beginning with the Sanskrit text NTI-STRA. NTYA meaning drama, and SHSTRA meaning science of a work attributed to the Radha Muni, where the gods declare that drama is a fifth Veda, because it is suitable for the degenerate age, as the best form of religious instruction. While the date of composition varies wildly among scholars, ranging from the era of Plato and Aristotle to the 7th century CE, the NTI-STRA presents the aesthetic concepts of Rasas and their associated B.H. Vass in Chapter 6 and 7 respectively, which appear to be independent of the work as a whole. Eight Rasas and associated B.H. Vass are named, and their enjoyment is likened to savoring a meal. RASA is the enjoyment of flavors that arise from the proper preparation of ingredients and the quality of ingredients. What RASA actually is, in a theoretical sense, is not discussed and given the anti-Ashstra's pithy wording it is unlikely the exact understanding of the original author, S, will be known. The theory of the Rasas develops significantly with the Kashmiri aesthetician and in Diverdina's classic on poetics, the Dhvani Loka which introduces the ninth RASA. S-H-N-T-A-R-A-S-A, as a specifically religious feeling of peace, N-T-A, which arises from its B-H-V-A, weariness of the pleasures of the world. The primary purpose of this text is to refine the literary concept Hvani, or poetic suggestion, by arguing for the existence of R-A-S-8 Hvani, primarily in forms of Sanskrit including a word, sentence, or whole work suggests a real-world emotional state or B-H-V-A. But thanks to aesthetic distance, the sensitive spectator relishes the RASA, the aesthetic flavor of tragedy, heroism, or romance. The 9th 10th century master of the religious system known as the non dual Shaivism of Kashmir or Kashmir Shaivism, and aesthetician, Abhinavagupta brought RASA theory to its pinnacle in his separate commentaries on the Dhvani Loka, the Dhvani Loka Lakana, translated by Ngals, Masson, and Pat Wardhan. 1992, and the Abhinava Bharati, his commentary on the anti-ash-stra, portions of which are translated by Noli and Masson and Pat Wardham. Abhinavagupta offers for the first time a technical definition of RASA which is the universal bliss of the self or Atman colored by the emotional tone of a drama. S-H-N-T-A-R-A-S-A functions as an equal member of the set of Rasas, but is simultaneously distinct being the most clear form of aesthetic bliss. Abhinavigupta likens it to the string of a jeweled necklace, while it may not be the most appealing for most people, it is the string that gives form to the necklace, allowing the jewels of the other eight Rasas to be relished. Relishing the Rasas and particularly S-H-N-T-A-R-A-S-A is hinted as being as good as but never equal to the bliss of self-realization experienced by yogis. Chinese Aesthetics Chinese art has a long history of varied styles and emphases. Confucius emphasized the role of the arts and humanities, especially music and poetry, in broadening human nature and aiding li etiquette, the rites, in bringing us back to what is essential about humanity. 
His opponent Mosey, however, argued that music and fine arts were classist and wasteful, benefiting the rich over the poor. By the 4th century ad artists had started debating and writing over the proper goals of art as well. Guca is he has left three surviving books on the theory of painting. Several later artists or scholars both created art and wrote about the creation of it. Religious and philosophical influences on art were common and diverse, but never universal. African Aesthetics The Great Mosque's signature trio of minaret overlooks the central market of Gen. Unique Malian Aesthetic African art existed in many forms and styles, and with fairly little influence from outside Africa. Most of it followed traditional forms, and the aesthetic norms were handed down orally as well as written. Sculpture and performance art are prominent, and abstract and partially abstracted forms are valued, and were valued long before influence from the Western tradition began in earnest. The Nak culture is testimony to this. The Mosque of Timbuktu shows that specific areas of Africa developed unique aesthetics, Arab aesthetics. Arab art for the last 1400 years has taken place under the context of Islam and is sometimes referred to as Islamic art, although many Arab artists throughout time have not been Muslim. The term Islamic refers not only to the religion, but to any form of art created by people in an Islamic culture or in an Islamic context, whether the artist is Islamic or not. Not all Muslims are in agreement on the use of art in religious observance, the proper place of art in society, or the relation between secular art and the demands placed on the secular world to conform to religious precepts. Islamic art frequently adopts secular elements and elements that are frowned upon, if not forbidden, by some Islamic theologians. Although the often cited opposition in Islam to the depiction of human and animal forms holds true for religious art and architecture, in the secular sphere, such representations have flourished in nearly all Islamic cultures. The Islamic resistance to the representation of living beings ultimately stems from the belief that the creation of living forms is unique to God, and it is for this reason that the role of images and image makers has been controversial. The strongest statements on the subject of figural depiction are made in the Hadith traditions of the Prophet, where painters are challenged to breathe life into their creations and threatened with punishment on the Day of Judgment. The Quran is less specific, but condemns idolatry, and uses the Arabic term Musawar, maker of forms, or artist, as an epithet for God. Partially as a result of this religious sentiment, figures in painting were often stylized, and, in some cases, the destruction of figurative artworks occurred. Iconoclasm was previously known in the Byzantine period and aniconicism was a feature of the Judaic world, thus placing the Islamic objection to figurative representations within a larger context. As ornament, However, figures were largely devoid of any larger significance, and perhaps therefore pose less challenge. This tendency affected the narrowing field of artistic possibility to such forms of art as arabesque, mosaic, Islamic calligraphy, and Islamic architecture, as well as any form of abstraction that can claim the status of non-representational art. Limited possibilities have been explored by artists as an outlet to artistic expression and has been cultivated to become a positive style and tradition, emphasizing the decorative function of art or its religious functions via non-representational forms such as geometric patterns, floral patterns, and arabesques. Human portrayals can be found in early Islamic cultures with varying degrees of acceptance by religious authorities. Human representation for the purpose of worship is uniformly considered idolatry, as forbidden in Sharia law. The calligraphic arts grew out of an effort to devote oneself to the study of the Koran. By patiently transcribing each word of the text, the writer was made to contemplate the meaning of it. As time passed, these calligraphic works began to be prized as works of art, growing increasingly elaborate in the illumination and stylizing of the text. These illuminations were applied to other works besides the Quran, and it became a respected art form, in and of itself. Arabic is written from right to left, like other Semitic scripts. 
and consists of 17 characters, which, with the addition of dots placed above or below certain of them, provide the 28 letters of the Arabic alphabet. Short vowels are not included in the alphabet, being indicated by signs placed above or below the consonant, or long vowel, that they follow. Certain characters may be joined to their neighbors, others to the preceding one only, and others to the succeeding one only. The written letters undergo a slight external change according to their position within a word. When they stand alone, or occur at the end of a word, they ordinarily terminate in a bold stroke, when they appear in the middle of a word, they are ordinarily joined to the letter following by a small, upward curved stroke. With the exception of six letters, which can be joined only to the preceding ones, the initial and medial letters are much abbreviated, while the final form consists of the initial form with a triumphant flourish. The essential part of the characters, however, remains unchanged. Western Medieval Aesthetics Lorsch Gospel 778-820 Charlemagne's Court School Surviving medieval art is primarily religious in focus, and funded largely by the state, Roman Catholic or Orthodox Church, powerful ecclesiastical individuals, or wealthy secular patrons. These art pieces often serve to liturgical function, whether as chalices, or even as church buildings themselves. Objects of fine art from this period were frequently made from rare and valuable materials, such as gold and lapis the cost of which commonly exceeded the wages of the artist. Medieval aesthetics in the realm of philosophy built upon classical thought, continuing the practice of Plotinus by employing theological terminology in its explications. St. Bonaventure's Retracing the Arts to Theology A primary example of this method discusses the skills of the artisan as gifts given by God for the purpose of disclosing God to mankind, which purpose is achieved through four lights, the light of skill in mechanical arts which discloses the world of artifacts, which light is guided by the light of sense perception which discloses the world of natural forms, which light, consequently, is guided by the light of philosophy which discloses the world of intellectual truth, finally, this light is guided by the light of divine wisdom which discloses the world of saving truth. St. Thomas Aquinas' aesthetic is probably the most famous and influential theory among medieval authors, having been the subject of much scrutiny, in the wake of the neo-scholastic revival of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and even having received the approbation of the celebrated modernist writer, James Joyce. Thomas, like many other medievals, never gives a systematic account of beauty itself, but several scholars have conventionally arranged his thought though not always with uniform conclusions using relevant observations spanning the entire corpus of his work. While Aquinas' theory follows generally the model of Aristotle, he develops a singular aesthetics which incorporates elements unique to his thought. Umberto echoes the aesthetics of Thomas Aquinas identifies the three main characteristics of beauty in Aquinas' philosophy, integritas sive perfecto, consonantia sive debita propulsio, and claritas sive splendor formae. While Aristotle likewise identifies the first two characteristics, St. Thomas conceives of the third as an appropriation from principles developed by Neoplatonic and Augustinian thinkers. With the shift from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, art likewise changed its focus as much in its content as in its mode of expression. Modern Aesthetics Cubist Painting by Georges Brack, Violin, and Candlestick, 1910 from the late 17th to the early 20th century Western aesthetics underwent a slow revolution into what is often called modernism. German and British thinkers emphasized beauty as the key component of art and of the aesthetic experience, and saw art as necessarily aiming at absolute beauty. For Alexander Gottlieb Baumgarten aesthetics is the science of the sense experiences, a younger sister of logic, and beauty is thus the most perfect kind of knowledge that sense experience can have. For Immanuel Kant the aesthetic experience of beauty is a judgment of a subjective, but similar human truth, since all people should agree that this rose is beautiful if it in fact is. However, beauty cannot be reduced to any more basic set of features. 
For Friedrich Schiller aesthetic appreciation of beauty is the most perfect reconciliation of the sensual and rational parts of human nature. For Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph Schelling, the philosophy of art is the organon of philosophy concerning the relation between man and nature. So aesthetics began now to be the name for the philosophy of art. Friedrich von Schlegel, August Wilhelm Schlegel, Friedrich Schleiermacher, and George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel have also given lectures on aesthetics as philosophy of art after 1800. For Hegel all culture is a matter of absolute spirit coming to be manifest to itself stage by stage, changing to a perfection that only philosophy can approach. Art is the first stage in which the absolute spirit is manifest immediately to sense perception, and is thus an objective rather than subjective revelation of beauty. For Arthur Schopenhauer aesthetic contemplation of beauty is the most free that the pure intellect can be from the dictates of will. Here we contemplate perfection of form, without any kind of worldly agenda, and thus any intrusion of utility or politics would ruin the point of the beauty. It is thus for Schopenhauer one way to fight the suffering. The British were largely divided into intuitionists and analytic camps. The intuitionists believed that aesthetic experience was disclosed by a single mental faculty of some kind. For Anthony Ashley Cooper, third or love Shaftesbury this was identical to the moral sense, beauty just is the sensory version of moral goodness. For Ludwig Wittgenstein aesthetics consisted in the description of a whole culture which is a linguistic impossibility. That which constitutes aesthetics lies outside the realm of the language game. For Oscar Wilde the contemplation of beauty for beauty's sake, augmented by John Ruskin's search for moral grounding, was not only the foundation for much of his literary career, but was quoted as saying aestheticism is a search after the signs of the beautiful. It is the science of the beautiful through which men seek the correlation of the arts, it is, to speak more exactly, the search after the secret of life. Wilde famously toured the United States in 1882. He traveled across the United States spreading the idea of aesthetics in a speech called the English Renaissance. In his speech he proposed that beauty and aesthetics was not languid but energetic. By beautifying the outward aspects of life, one would beautify the inner ones. The English Renaissance was, he said, like the Italian Renaissance, before it, a sort of rebirth of the spirit of man. William Hogarth, Self-Portrait, 1745 For Francis Hutcheson beauty is disclosed by an inner mental sense, but is a subjective fact rather than an objective one. Analytic theorists, like Henry Home, Lord Kames, William Hogarth, and Edmund Burke hoped to reduce beauty to some list of attributes. Hogarth, for example, thinks that beauty consists of, 1. Fitness of the parts to some design, 2. Variety in as many ways as possible, 3. Uniformity, regularity, or symmetry, which is only beautiful when it helps to preserve the character of fitness. 4. Simplicity or distinctness, which gives pleasure not in itself, but through its enabling the eye to enjoy variety with ease. 5. Intricacy, which provides employment for our active energies, leading the eye on a wanton kind of chase. And 6. Quantity or magnitude, which draws our attention and produces admiration and awe. Later analytic aestheticians strove to link beauty to some scientific theory of psychology, such as James Mill, or biology, such as Herbert Spencer. Postmodern Aesthetics and Psychoanalysis Example of the Dada Aesthetic, Marcel Duchamp's Fountain 1917 Early 20th century artists, poets, and composers challenged existing notions of beauty, broadening the scope of art and aesthetics. In 1941, Eli Siegel, American philosopher and poet, founded aesthetic realism, the philosophy that reality itself is aesthetic, and that the world, art, and self explain each other, each is the aesthetic oneness of opposites. Various attempts have been made to define postmodern aesthetics. The challenge to the assumption that beauty was central to art and aesthetics, thought to be original, is actually continuous with older aesthetic theory. Aristotle was the first in the Western tradition to classify beauty in two types, as in his theory of drama, and Kant made a distinction between beauty and the sublime. 
What was new was a refusal to credit the higher status of certain types, where the taxonomy implied the preference for tragedy, and the sublime to comedy, and the rococo. Croce suggested that expression is central in the way that beauty was once thought to be central. George Dickey suggested that the sociological institutions of the art world were the glue binding art and sensibility and two unities. Marshall McLuhan suggested that art always functions as a counter-environment designed to make visible what is usually invisible about a society page needed. Theodore Dorno felt that aesthetics could not proceed without confronting the role of the culture industry in the commodification of art and aesthetic experience. How Foster attempted to portray the reaction against beauty and modernist art in the anti-aesthetic essays on postmodern culture. Arthur Danto has described this reaction as caliphobia, after the Greek word for beauty, kalos. Andre Malraux explains that the notion of beauty was connected to a particular conception of art that arose with the Renaissance and was still dominant in the 18th century, but was supplanted later. The discipline of aesthetics, which originated in the 18th century, mistook this transient state of affairs for a revelation of the permanent nature of art. Brian Masumi suggests a reconsider beauty following the aesthetical thought in the philosophy of Dale and Guattari. The field of experimental aesthetics was founded by Gustav Theodor Fechner in the 19th century. Experimental aesthetics is characterized by a subject-based, inductive approach. The analysis of individual experience and behavior based on experimental methods is a central part of experimental aesthetics. In particular, the perception of works of art, music, or modern items such websites, or other art products is studied. Experimental aesthetics is strongly oriented towards the natural sciences. Modern approaches mostly come from the fields of cognitive psychology or neuroscience, neuroaesthetics. Numist aestheticism is a theory of art, and a highly experimental approach to art negating historical preconceptions of the aesthetic. Jean-Francois Lyotari invokes the Kantian distinction between taste and the sublime. Sublime painting, unlike Kitrealism, will enable us to see only by making it impossible to see, it will please only by causing pain. Sigmund Freud inaugurated aesthetical thinking and psychoanalysis mainly via the uncanny, as aesthetical affect. Following Freud and Merleau-Ponty, Jacques Lassen theorized aesthetics in terms of sublimation and the thing. Guy Cercello pioneered efforts in analytic philosophy to develop a rigorous theory of aesthetics, focusing on the concepts of beauty, love, and sublimity. In contrast to Romantic theorist Sircello argued for the objectivity of beauty, and formulated a theory of love on that basis. British philosopher and theorist of conceptual art aesthetics, Peter Osborne, makes the point that that post-conceptual art aesthetic does not concern a particular type of contemporary art so much as the historical ontological condition for the production of contemporary art in general. Osborne first noted that contemporary art is post-conceptual in a public lecture delivered at the Fondazione Antonio Ratti, Villa Sacota in Como on July 9, 2010. It is a claim made at the level of the ontology of the work of art, rather than say at the descriptive level of style or movement. Evolutionary Aesthetics Evolutionary aesthetics refers to evolutionary psychology theories, in which the basic aesthetic preferences of Homo sapiens are argued to have evolved in order to enhance survival and reproductive success. One example being that humans are argued to find beautiful and prefer landscapes which were good habitats in the ancestral environment. Another example is that body symmetry is an important aspect of physical attractiveness which may be due to this indicating good health during body growth. Evolutionary explanations for aesthetical preferences are important parts of evolutionary musicology, Darwinian literary studies, and the study of the evolution of emotion. Aesthetics and Information Initial image of a Mandelbrot set zoom sequence with continuously colored environment. In the 1970s, Abraham Moles and Friedernake were among the first to analyze links between aesthetics, information processing, and information theory. 
In the 1990s, Jürgen Schmidhuber described an algorithmic theory of beauty which takes the subjectivity of the observer into account and postulates, among several observations classified as comparable by a given subjective observer. The aesthetically most pleasing one is the one with the shortest description, given the observer's previous knowledge and his particular method for encoding the data. This is closely related to the principles of algorithmic information theory and minimum description length. One of his examples, mathematicians enjoy simple proofs with a short description in their formal language. Another very concrete example describes an aesthetically pleasing human face whose proportions can be described by very few bits of information. Drawing inspiration from less detailed 15th century proportion studies by Leonardo da Vinci and Albrecht Durer, Schmidhuber's theory explicitly distinguishes between what's beautiful and what's interesting, stating that interestingness corresponds to the first derivative of subjectively perceived beauty. Here the premise is that any observer continually tries to improve the predictability and compressibility of the observations by discovering regularities such as repetitions and symmetries, and fractal self-similarity. Whenever the observer's learning process, which may be a predictive neural network, see also neuroesthetics, leads to improved data compression such that the observation sequence can be described by fewer bits than before. The temporary interestingness of the data corresponds to the number of saved bits. This compression progress is proportional to the observer's internal reward, also called curiosity reward. A reinforcement learning algorithm is used to maximize future expected reward by learning to execute action sequences that cause additional interesting input data with yet unknown but learnable predictability or regularity. The principles can be implemented on artificial agents which then exhibit a form of artificial curiosity. Applied Aesthetics as well as being applied to art, aesthetics can also be applied to cultural objects such as crucifix or tools. Aesthetic coupling between art objects and medical topics was made by speakers working for the U.S. Information Agency. This coupling was made to reinforce the learning paradigm. When English language speakers use translators to address audiences in their own country, these audiences were generally not fluent in the English language. It can also be used in topics as diverse as mathematics, gastronomy, fashion, and website design. Aesthetic Ethics Aesthetic ethics refers to the idea that human conduct and behavior ought to be governed by that which is beautiful and attractive. John Dewey has pointed out that the unity of aesthetics and ethics is in fact reflected in our understanding of behavior being fair the word having a double meaning of attractive and morally acceptable. More recently, James Page has suggested that aesthetic ethics might be taken to form a philosophical rationale for peace education, Aristotle, beauty, and goodness. Aristotle was passionate about goodness in men, as he valued taking its virtues to be central to a well-lived life. In politics, he writes, again, men in general desire the good, and not merely what their fathers had. To thoroughly comprehend goodness, Aristotle also studied beauty. As noted in the Encyclopedia Britannica, 1902, moreover, Aristotle ignores all conceptions of an absolute beauty, and at the same time seeks to distinguish the beautiful from the good. Aristotle explains that men will be better able to achieve their good if they develop a fuller understanding of what it is to flourish. Truth as Beauty, Mathematics, Analytic Philosophy, and Physics Mathematical considerations, such as symmetry and complexity, are used for analysis in theoretical aesthetics. This is different from the aesthetic considerations of applied aesthetics used in the study of mathematical beauty. Aesthetic considerations such as symmetry and simplicity are used in areas of philosophy, such as ethics, and theoretical physics and cosmology to define truth outside of empirical considerations. Beauty and truth have been argued to be nearly synonymous, as reflected in the statement Beauty is Truth, Truth Beauty, in the poem Ode, on a Grecian urn by John Keats, or by the Hindu motto Satyam Shivam Sundaram Satya, Truth is Shiva, God, and Shiva is Sundaram, Beautiful. The fact 
that judgments of beauty and judgments of truth both are influenced by process influency, which is the ease with which information can be processed, has been presented as an explanation for why beauty is sometimes equated with truth. Indeed, recent research found that people use beauty as an indication for truth in mathematical pattern tasks. Computational Inference of Aesthetics Since about 2005, computer scientists have attempted to develop automated methods to infer aesthetic quality of images. Typically, these approaches follow a machine learning approach, where large numbers of manually rated photographs are used to teach a computer about what visual properties are of relevance to aesthetic quality. The Aquine Engine developed at Penn State University, rates natural photographs uploaded by users. Notable in this area is Michael Layton, professor of psychology at Rutgers University. Layton is the president of the International Society for Mathematical and Computational Aesthetics and the International Society for Group Theory and Cognitive Science and has developed a generative theory of shape. There have also been relatively successful attempts with regard to chess and music. A relation between Max Benz's mathematical formulation of aesthetics in terms of redundancy and complexity and theories of musical anticipation was offered using the notion of information rate. Aesthetic Judgment Judgments of aesthetic value rely on our ability to discriminate at a sensory level. Aesthetics examines our effective domain response to an object or phenomenon. Immanuel Kant, writing in 1790, observes of a man if he says that canary wine is agreeable he is quite content if someone else corrects his terms and reminds him to say instead, it is agreeable to me, because everyone has his own sense of taste. The case of beauty is different from mere agreeableness, because, if he proclaims something to be beautiful, then he requires the same liking from others, he then judges not just for himself, but for everyone, and speaks of beauty, as if it were a property of things. Aesthetic judgments usually go beyond sensory discrimination. For David Hume, delicacy of taste is not merely the ability to detect all the ingredients in a composition, but also our sensitivity to pains as well as pleasures, which escape the rest of mankind. Essays Moral Political and Literary Indianapolis, Literary Classics 5, 1987 Thus, the sensory discrimination is linked to capacity for pleasure. For Kant enjoyment is the result, when pleasure rises from sensation, but judging something to be beautiful has a third requirement, sensation must give rise to pleasure by engaging our capacities of reflective contemplation. Judgments of beauty are sensory, emotional and intellectual all at once. Fewer interpretations of beauty possess two concepts of value, aesthetics, and taste. Aesthetics is the philosophical notion of beauty. Taste is a result of an education process and awareness of elite cultural values learned through exposure to mass culture. Bourdieu examined how the elite in society define the aesthetic values, like taste, and how varying levels of exposure to these values can result in variations by class, cultural background, and education. According to Kant, beauty is subjective and universal, thus certain things are beautiful to everyone. The contemporary view of beauty is not based on innate qualities, but rather on cultural specifics and individual interpretations. Factors involved in aesthetic judgment Rainbows often have aesthetic appeal. Judgments of aesthetical value seem often to involve many other kinds of issues as well. Responses such as disgust show that sensory detection is linked in instinctual ways to facial expressions and even behaviors like the gag reflex. Yet disgust can often be a learned or cultural issue too. As Darwin pointed out, seeing a stripe of soup in a man's beard is disgusting even though neither soup nor beards are themselves disgusting. Aesthetic judgments may be a link to emotions, or, like emotions, partially embodied in our physical reactions. Seeing a sublime view of a landscape may give us a reaction of awe, which might manifest physically, as an increased heart rate, or widened eyes. These unconscious reactions may even be partly constitutive of what makes our judgment a judgment, that the landscape is sublime. Likewise, aesthetic judgments may be culturally conditioned to some extent. 
Victorians in Britain often saw African sculpture as ugly, but just a few decades later, Edwardian audience saw the same sculptures as being beautiful. Evaluations of beauty may well be linked to desirability, perhaps even to sexual desirability. Thus, judgments of aesthetic value can become linked to judgments of economic, political, or moral value. In a current context, one might judge Lamborghini to be beautiful partly because it is desirable as a status symbol, or we might judge it to be repulsive partly because it signifies for us overconsumption and offends our political or moral values. Aesthetic judgments can often be very fine-grained and internally contradictory. Likewise aesthetic judgments seem often to be at least partly intellectual and interpretative. It is what the thing means, or symbolizes for us, that is often what we are judging. Modern aestheticians have asserted that will and desire were almost dormant in aesthetic experience, yet preference and choice have seemed important aesthetics to some 20th century thinkers. The point is already made by Hume, but see Mary Mother Sill, Beauty, and the Critic's Judgment in the Blackwell Guide to Aesthetics, 2004. Thus aesthetic judgments might be seen to be based on the senses, emotions, intellectual opinions, will, desires, culture, preferences, values, subconscious behavior, conscious decision, training, instinct, sociological institutions, or some complex combination of these, depending on exactly which theory one employs. Are different art forms beautiful, disgusting, or boring in the same way? A third major topic in the study of aesthetic judgments is how they are unified across art forms. We can call a person, a house, a symphony, a fragrance, and a mathematical proof beautiful. What characteristics do they share which give them that status? What possible feature could a proof and a fragrance both share in virtue of which they both count as beautiful? What makes a painting beautiful is quite different from what makes music beautiful, which suggests that each art form has its own language for the judgment of aesthetics. At the same time, there is seemingly quite a lack of words to express oneself accurately when making an aesthetic judgment. An aesthetic judgment cannot be an empirical judgment. Therefore, due to impossibility for precision, there is confusion about what interpretations can be culturally negotiated. Due to imprecision in the standard English language, two completely different feelings experienced by two different people can be represented by an identical verbal expression. Wittgenstein stated this in his lectures on aesthetics and language games. A collective identification of beauty with willing participants in a given social spectrum may be a socially negotiated phenomenon discussed in a culture or context. Is there some underlying unity to aesthetic judgment, and is there some way to articulate the similarities of a beautiful house, beautiful proof, and beautiful sunset? Defining it requires a description of the entire phenomenon, as Wittgenstein argued in his lectures on aesthetics. Likewise there has been long debate on how perception of beauty in the natural world especially perception of the human form as beautiful, is supposed to relate to perceiving beauty in art or artifacts. This goes back at least to Kant, with some echoes even in St. Bonaventure. Aesthetics and the Philosophy of Art Aesthetics is for the artist as ornithology is for the birds. Barnett Newman for some, aesthetics is considered a synonym for the philosophy of art since Hegel, while others insist that there is a significant distinction between these closely related fields. In practice aesthetic judgment refers to the sensory contemplation or appreciation of an object, not necessarily an art object, while artistic judgment refers to the recognition, appreciation, or criticism of art, or an artwork. Philosophical aesthetics has not only to speak about art and to produce judgments about artworks, but has also to give a definition of what art is. Art is an autonomous entity for philosophy because art deals with the senses, i.e. the etymology of aesthetics, and art is as such free of any moral or political purpose. Hence, there are two different conceptions of art in aesthetics art as knowledge or art as action, but aesthetics is neither epistemology nor ethics. What is art? Harmony of colors. 
How best to define the term art is a subject of constant contention. Many books and journal articles have been published arguing over even the basics of what we mean by the term art. Theodore Dorno claimed in 1969 it is self-evident that nothing concerning art is self-evident. Artists, philosophers, anthropologists, psychologists, and programmers all use the notion of art in their respective fields and give it operational definitions that vary considerably. Furthermore, it is clear that even the basic meaning of the term art has changed several times over the centuries and has continued to evolve during the 20th century as well. The main recent sense of the word art is roughly as an abbreviation for creative art or fine art. Here we mean that skill is being used to express the artist's creativity, or to engage the audience's aesthetic sensibilities, or to draw the audience towards consideration of the finer things. Often, if the skill is being used in a functional object, people will consider it a craft instead of art, a suggestion which is highly disputed by many contemporary craft thinkers. Likewise, if the skill is being used in a commercial or industrial way it may be considered design instead of art, or contrarywise these may be defended as art forms, perhaps called applied art. Some thinkers, for instance, have argued that the difference between fine art and applied art has more to do with the actual function of the object than any clear definitional difference. Art usually implies no function other than to convey or communicate an idea. Even as late. As 1912 it was normal in the West, to assume that all art aims at beauty, and us that anything that wasn't trying to be beautiful couldn't count as art. The Cubists, Dadaists, Stravinsky, and many later art movements struggled against this conception that beauty was central to the definition of art, with such success, that, according to Danto, beauty had disappeared not only from the advanced art of the 1960s, but, from the advanced philosophy of art of that decade as well. Perhaps some notion, like expression in Croce's theories, or counter-environment in McLuhan's theory, can replace the previous role of beauty. Brian Masumi brought back beauty into consideration together with expression. Another view, as important to the philosophy of art as beauty, is that of the sublime, elaborated upon in the 20th century by the postmodern philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard. A further approach, elaborated by André Malraux in works such as The Voices of Silence, is that art is fundamentally a response to a metaphysical question, art, he writes, is an anti-destiny. Mauro argues that, while art has sometimes been oriented towards beauty and the sublime, principally in post-Renaissance European art, these qualities, as the wider history of art demonstrates, are by no means essential to it. Perhaps, as in Kenick's theory, no definition of art is possible anymore. Perhaps art should be thought of as a cluster of related concepts in a Wittgensteinian fashion, as in White's or Buies. Another approach is to say that art is basically a sociological category, that whatever art schools and museums and artists define as art is considered art regardless of formal definitions. This institutional definition of art see also institutional critique, has been championed by George Dickey. Most people did not consider the depiction of a Brillo box, or a store-bought urinal, to be art until Andy Warhol and Marcel Duchamp, respectively, place them in the context of art, i.e., the art gallery, which then provided the association of these objects with the associations that define art. Proceduralists often suggest that it is the process by which a work of art is created or viewed that makes it art, not any inherent feature of an object, or how well received it is by the institutions of the art world, after its introduction to society at large. If a poet writes down several lines, intending them as a poem, the very procedure by which it is written makes it a poem. Whereas if a journalist writes exactly the same set of words, intending them as shorthand notes to help him write a longer article later, these would not be a poem. Leo Tolstoy, on the other hand, claims that what decides whether or not something is art is how it is experienced by its audience, not by the intention of its creator. Functionalists, like Monroe Beardsley, argue that whether or not a piece counts as art depends on what function it plays in a particular context. The same Greek vase may play a non-artistic function in one context, carrying wine, 
and an artistic function, in another context, helping us to appreciate the beauty of the human figure. See also, classificatory disputes about art. What should we judge when we judge art? Nature provides aesthetic ideals. Art can be difficult at the metaphysical and ontological levels as well, as at the value theory level. When we see a performance of Hamlet, how many works of art are we experiencing? And which should we judge? Perhaps there is only one relevant work of art, the whole performance, which many different people have contributed to, and which will exist briefly, and then disappear. Perhaps the manuscript by Shakespeare is a distinct work of art from the play by the troupe, which is also distinct from the performance of the play by this troupe on this night, and all three can be judged, but are to be judged by different standards. Perhaps every person involved should be judged separately on his or her own merits, and each costume or line is its own work of art, with perhaps the director having the job of unifying them all. Similar problems arise for music film, dance, and even painting. Is one to judge the painting itself, the work of the painter, or perhaps the painting in its context of presentation by the museum workers? These problems have been made even more difficult by the rise of conceptual art since the 1960s Warhol's famous Brillo boxes are nearly indistinguishable from actual Brillo boxes, at the time. It would be a mistake to praise Warhol for the design of his boxes, which were designed by Steve Harvey, yet the conceptual move of exhibiting these boxes as art in a museum together with other kinds of paintings is Warhol's. Are we judging Warhol's concept? His execution of the concept in the medium? The curator's insight in letting Warhol display the boxes? The overall result? Our experience or interpretation of the result? Ontologically, how are we to think of the work of art? Is it a physical object? Several objects? A class of objects? A mental object? A fictional object? An abstract object? An event? Or simply an act? What should art be like? Many goals have been argued for art, and aestheticians often argue that some goal or another is superior in some way. Clement Greenberg, for instance, argued in 1960 that each artistic medium should seek that which makes it unique among the possible mediums, and then purify itself of anything other than expression of its own uniqueness, as a form. The Dadaist Tristan Sarah on the other hand saw the function of art, in 1918, as the destruction of a mad social order. We must sweep, and clean. Affirm the cleanliness of the individual after the state of madness, aggressive complete madness of a world abandoned to the hands of bandits. Formal goals, creative goals, self-expression, political goals, spiritual goals, philosophical goals, and even more perceptual or aesthetic goals have all been popular pictures of what art should be like. The value of art. Tolstoy defined art as the following. Art is a human activity consisting in this, that one man consciously, by means of certain external signs, hands on to others feelings he has lived through, and that other people are infected by these feelings, and also experience them. However, this definition is merely a starting point for his theory of art's value. To some extent, the value of art, for Tolstoy, is one with the value of empathy. However, sometimes empathy is not of value. In Chapter 15 of What is Art Tolstoy says that some feelings are good, but others are bad, and so art is only valuable when it generates empathy, or shared feeling for good feelings. For example, Tolstoy asserts that empathy for decadent members of the ruling class makes society worse, rather than better. In Chapter 16 he asserts that the best art is universal art that expresses simple and accessible positive feeling. The section possibly contains original research. Please improve it by verifying the claims made and adding in lean citations. Statements consisting only of original research may be removed. December 2012 Other possible views are these. Art can act as a means to some special kind of knowledge. Art may give insight into the human condition. Art relates to science and religion. Art serves as a tool of education, or indoctrination, or enculturation. Art makes us more moral. It uplifts us spiritually.
Art is politics by other means. Art has the value of allowing catharsis. In any case, the value of art may determine the suitability of an art form. Do they differ significantly in their values, or, if not, in their ability, to achieve the unitary value of art? But to approach the question of the value of art systematically, one ought to ask, for whom? For the artist? For the audience? For society at large, and slash, or for individuals beyond the audience? Is the value of art different in each of these different contexts? Working on the intended value of art tends to help define the relations between art and other acts. Art clearly does have spiritual goals in many contexts, but what exactly is the difference between religious art and religion per se? The truth is complex. Art is both useless in a functional sense and also the most important human activity. An argument for the value of art used in the fictional work The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, proceeds that, if some external force presenting imminent destruction of Earth asked humanity what its value was what should humanity's response be? The argument continues that the only justification humanity could give for its continued existence would be the past creation and continued creation of things like a Shakespeare play, a Rembrandt painting, or a Bach concerto. The suggestion is that these are the things of value which define humanity. Whatever one might think of this claim, and it does seem to undervalue the many other achievements of which human beings have shown themselves capable, both individually and collectively, it is true that art appears to possess a special capacity to endure, live on beyond the moment of its birth, in many cases for centuries or millennia. This capacity of art to endure over time, what precisely it is and how it operates, has been widely neglected in modern aesthetics. Aesthetic Universals The philosopher Dennis Dutton identified six universal signatures in human aesthetics. Expertise or virtuosity Humans cultivate, recognize, and admire technical artistic skills. Non-utilitarian pleasure People enjoy art for art's sake and don't demand that it keep them warm or put food on the table. Style Artistic objects and performances satisfy rules of composition that place them in a recognizable style. Criticism People make a point of judging, appreciating, and interpreting works of art. Imitation With a few important exceptions, like abstract painting. Works of art simulate experiences of the world. Special focus. Art is set aside from ordinary life and made the dramatic focus of experience. It might be objected, however, that there are rather too many exceptions to Dutton's categories. For example, the installations of the contemporary artist Thomas Hirschhorn deliberately eschew technical virtuosity. People can appreciate a Renaissance Madonna for aesthetic reasons, but such objects often had, and sometimes still have, specific devotional functions. Rules of composition that might be read into Duchamp's Fountain or John Cage's 433 do not locate the works in a recognizable style, or certainly not a style recognizable at the time of the work's realization. Moreover, some of Dutton's categories seem too broad. A physicist might entertain hypothetical worlds in his slash her imagination in the course of formulating a theory. Another problem is that Dutton's categories seek to universalize traditional European notions of aesthetics and art forgetting that, as André Mauro and others have pointed out, there have been large numbers of cultures in which such ideas, including the idea art itself, were non-existent. Criticism The philosophy of aesthetics as a practice has been criticized by some sociologists and writers of art and society. Raymond Williams argues that there is no unique and or individual aesthetic object which can be extrapolated from the art world, but that there is a continuum of cultural forms and experience of which ordinary speech and experiences may signal as art. By art we may frame several artistic works or creations as so though this reference remains within the institution or special event which creates it. And this leaves some works, or other possible art outside of the framework, or other interpretations such as other phenomenon which may not be considered as art. Pierre Bourdieu disagrees with Kant's idea of the aesthetic. 
He argues that Kant's aesthetic merely represents an experience that is the product of an elevated class habitus and scholarly leisure, as opposed to other possible and equally valid aesthetic experiences which lay outside Kant's narrow definition.